coming up on Network Africa. U.S. President Joe Biden promises to rebuild ties with African Union. Fifteen members of Ghana's parliament test positive for coronavirus. Plus... Mozambique imposes nighttime curfew in the Greater Maputo region, the country's epicenter of the coronavirus outbreak. Welcome to the program. I'm Teniola Shuboale. U.S. President Joe Biden has promised to rebuild his country's partnership with the African Union. Earlier today, the White House tweeted a video of President Biden's remarks to the continental body ahead of its 34th summit. Mr. Biden also promised to engage the EU in addressing conflicts on the continent. His predecessor, Donald Trump, sparked a dispute in 2018 after allegedly using a derogatory word to describe African nations. Mr. Trump later denied that he is racist. I'm honored to send the best wishes of the people of the United States in advance of the 34th African Union Summit. This past year has shown us how interconnected our world is and how our fates are bound up together. That's why my administration is committing to rebuilding our partnership around the world and re-engaging with international institutions like the African Union. We must all work together to advance our shared vision of a better future, a future of growing trade and investment that advances prosperity for all our nations, a future that advances lives of peace and security for all our citizens, a future committed to investing in our democratic institutions and promoting the human rights of all people. To reach this future, we also must confront the serious challenges we face. That includes investing more in global health, defeating COVID-19 and working to prevent, detect and respond to future health crises. Well, let's discuss this further with African Affairs Analyst Alistair Wilcox. Thank you so much for joining us on Network Africa. Thank you for having me. It's my pleasure. Well, in his first foreign policy speech since taking office, President Biden has promised to engage the AU in addressing conflicts on the continent. These include Ethiopia's Tigray crisis and also the post-election crisis in the CAR. How can the U.S. president go about this, though, without infringing on the country's sovereignty? Well, uh, when there's a conflict, the issue of sovereignty becomes uh, secondary because uh, everyone needs help resolving such conflicts. Uh, and it's gratifying that uh, the president, uh, Joe Biden, is taking a different tone from his uh, predecessor, uh, who did not see Africa as part of his responsibility. Um, the, 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 the remarks made by Donald Trump in the early days of his uh, administration put a uh, uh, spanner in the box of African relationship with America. And he went ahead to exhibit it in various, in different various fora, that they, whereby he never saw Africa as part of his agenda. And he saw Africa as a people that should be, uh, that should be conquered and should not have voice in the Committee of Nations. But I think uh, Joseph Biden is trying to rebuild all that. And he has shown uh, 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 strength of character, even with other other part of the world, EU, uh, EU uh, Russia, China, all that Donald Trump has destroyed in his first four, in his four years, Joe Biden is trying to build it. So, in, in, it, so it's not uh, out of place him to want to intervene, uh, 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 intervene in the conflict because there have been too many conflicts in Africa that have remained unanswered since America went on holiday as far as Africa affairs is concerned. The Ethiopian crisis is there, like you've just mentioned, the CARO. And nothing is being done about it. AU is incapable of handling some of this crisis. And we need forces like the United States with their muscles to intervene in such areas. So it's not to really affect um, sovereignty. We don't need 
I would say when there's conflict, because sovereignty does not, I mean, you can't be claiming sovereignty if your country is on fire. You need help. So that's what, uh, uh, we, this help has been long overdue. Not, not, not until now that there's a ginger religion in Washington. This help is long overdue. And I'm sure the, the AU and even the people of CAR, the people of Ethiopia, we welcome this aid from Africa, from, from America. Yeah, Minister Wilcox, you know, the president says America is back. Diplomacy is back. We're expecting wide sweeping changes. In what other areas are Africans expecting cooperation from the Joe Biden administration? Well, if you look at it, uh, the Democrats, uh, whenever they have White House, Africa is used to have a good deal. Uh, because uh, maybe because they, they have a black population that supports the Democratic Party, unlike when Republicans is in power. Uh, it was it became worse in the last four years when uh, Joe Biden, when uh, Donald Trump, who I uh, who the world would see as a racist, even Americans would see as racist because he believes so much in the white supremacy movement. When he was in power, he he, he, he delegated Africa, in fact, called them all kinds of derogatory names. I mean, was so antagonistic. Never visit Africa. I'm sure his uh, Secretary of State only uh, the first one tells him visit Africa. I, I'm not sure this last one visited Africa. So um, there are so many ways. The Agua is still there. The Agua uh, 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 program is there. There are other economic programs that uh, that we have put on hold. Aids, various aid programs were put on hold because Africa was not part of his problem, but as part of, part of uh, Donald Trump's agenda. So. There are many, many more ways. There are conflicts all over. There are rebuilding of infrastructure. There are economic cooperation. So um, when the president said diplomacy is back and America is back, it shows that they are going back to the old days of the Bill Clinton administration, the, uh, uh, the, the, the Obama administration, when they took African affairs as a serious business. And, and I think Joe Biden has been part of those administrations, either as a Congress, either as a senator or as a vice president. So he understands Washington. He understands the importance of Africa. He understands how cooperation brings about stability in America. So he has a lot. In fact, the, I'm sure there's going to be an open check for African leaders to tap into in getting back the glory that they've lost in the last four years. So it's a welcome development. And Africa is, I'm sure, they are ready to do business with the new helmsman in the White House. All right, then, African Affairs Analyst, Alistair Wilcox, thank you so much for sharing your thoughts and analysis with us on Network Africa. It's my pleasure. It's my pleasure for having me. To our coverage of the COVID-19 pandemic now, Malawi is setting up field hospitals to cope with COVID-19 cases as the country faces a resurgence of the virus. Earlier this year, President Lazarus Chakwera lost two cabinet ministers to the disease, and he said that the health system is facing a quite desperate situation. But attempts by the Coronavirus Task Force to enforce more restrictions have been met with court injunctions. According to the health ministry, there are 25,884 confirmed cases of the virus, including 779 deaths. Well, 15 members of the Ghanaian parliament and 56 staff members have contracted the coronavirus. Speaker Alban Bagbin says the members returned positive tests following a recent round of testing. The infected lawmakers and staff have been asked to self-isolate while undergoing treatment. Consequently, parliament will only sit on Tuesdays and Thursdays from next week, with entry permitted to MPs and staff needed for the business of those days. Ghana has so far recorded over 69,255 cases and 440 deaths since it reported its first case in March last year. Now, Mozambique's president, Felipe Nyusi, has imposed a nighttime curfew in the country's epicenter 
of the coronavirus outbreak. The 30-day curfew comes amid increasing number of infections and deaths. It will be enacted in the greater Maputo region, including the capital, the town of Matola and the districts of Marakuni and Boan from 9 p.m. to 4 a.m. It's the first time a curfew has been imposed in the country since the civil war ended in 1992. Essential service providers will not be affected by the curfew. In an address to the nation, President Nyusi also announced a raft of restrictions, including closure of all places of worship, a ban on conferences and religious celebrations, and the postponement of the resumption of face-to-face -face classes in schools for 30 days. Every 6th of February, the United Nations marks the International Day of Zero Tolerance for Female Genital Mutilation. This year's theme is No Time for Global Inaction. This commemoration is part of a combined effort by the UN to meet one of its Sustainable Development Goal, uh, Goals 5, achieving gender equality and empowering all women and girls. The target aims to eliminate all harmful practices such as child, early and forced marriage and FGM. Female genital mutilation comprises all procedures that involve altering or injuring the female genitalia for non-medical reasons and is recognized internationally as a violation of the human rights, the health and the integrity of girls and women. Now, Lola Longe, Executive Director, Child Health Advocacy Initiative, joins us now on the program for more on this. Thank you so much for speaking to us on Network Africa. Thank you for having me. Well, let's begin with what the significance of this day's theme, raising awareness on International Day of Zero Tolerance for FGM. Yeah, the day is actually set aside to raise awareness on why we should end FGM. Uh, this is a cultural practice, and it's been there for a long time. Um, obviously, it's really affecting the girl child, and it is a violation of the rights of the girl child. It is child abuse, just like you just mentioned, that it's a violation of the rights of the girl child. And this has been on for a very long time. It's actually a global issue. Uh, that's why it's one of the issues um, being addressed on the gender equality, SDG 5, which must be achieved by the year 2030. So how do we get about doing this? And that's why the day has been set aside, to raise awareness, to get everybody, like the team for this year, to unite and see how we can all work together to end FGM. So it's a day that uh, globally is going to be celebrated at 6 tomorrow, and everybody is working together to see how they can end FGM, which is one of the goals to be achieved by 2030. You know, FGM has major health implications on young girls, but sadly, it is still practiced in some rural areas, even here in Nigeria. How can individuals and government bodies unite, fund and act uh, to end this horrible practice? Yeah, that's why I'm actually happy about the team for this year. Everybody must come together to see how to work in FGM. And that starts from um, the traditional rulers. It's a kind of a cultural thing that uh, it's been practiced over the years. But we know that culture that is not actually favorable should be changed or should be stopped. And that's the case with human genital mutilation. Uh, we need to get the traditional rulers involved so that we can actually lead the campaign in their community and get the people to see the side effect, the, the negative implication of um, female genital mutilation. For example, in Osho State, we have uh, about 72% um, where we have the highest prevalence in Nigeria. I'm happy the only of fair is actually championing the campaign. And we have a lot of other traditional rulers all over Nigeria, and I'm sure in some other uh, countries as well, working together to see how they can end the end of gym. So we also use on the religious leaders as well, because some say, oh, it's in the Quran, and, but it's not actually in the Quran, nor is it in the Bible. So the religious leaders are to speak to their people and let them know they must end the practice because it's a violation of the rights of a girl child. We also have cases of um, using the youths as well because we have a slogan where we say it must end in one generation. It's like, it's maybe it's been practiced before, but this generation is going to end it. They are not going to 
do it for their own children. So there's a kind of campaign and a movement of young people actually raising awareness, saying, well, if I have my own child, my own girl child will not be circumcised. Then apart from the youths as well, we also, we're using medical professionals who we believe can help to prevent and then raise awareness as well. For example, a lot of them go to the hospital, they say, okay, maybe because it's done in the community, they're using non-sterilized um, objects, but not it's beyond that. Even when it's done in the hospital, it is a violation of the right of the girl child and it has its implication. So that, what does we call medicalization of FGM? So we use the medical personnel all over to raise awareness and they have joined in the campaign as well. And then we also use in the media and I'm happy channels is actually taking time to look into why uh, FGM was end in Nigeria and globally. So the media will help to amplify the messages that FGM will stop and that um, they, it is really, it's really not necessary to continue to mutilate the girl child. And we also have men who we are using now to champion the cause because some say yeah. FGM is uh, done for the man uh, and the men are saying we don't need our girls to be mutilated. So men are coming together to join the campaign as well to yeah. end FGM. Uh, uh, all right, then, Lola Longhe, Executive Director, Child Health Advocacy Initiative. Uh, thank you so much for joining us on Network Africa to talk about this very, very uh, important issue. Thank you so much once again. Still to come on the program. Our Africa Tech segment takes a look at the effects of the COVID-19 pandemic on startups in Africa. Please stay with us. Thanks for staying with us on Network Africa. The United Nations says tensions remain quite high in many parts of the Central African Republic, with the last major attack taking place on the 13th of January. Speaking via video link from the CAR's capital, Bongi, the Deputy Special Representative for MINUSCA, Dennis Brown, said that the combatants were successfully stopped. UN peacekeepers in CAR and other allied forces supported the CAR's national army in repelling the attack. In quite high in, in many parts of the country, but in terms of the numbers of attacks uh, that we saw, for instance, in the beginning of middle of December, uh, there's been a significant decrease. The last major attack was on the 13th of January when combatants, a few hundred combatants, tried to come into to banking. That was successfully stopped. Yesterday, I'm really happy to announce that we managed to bring in a humanitarian convoy it made it through the most difficult part of that road, and so we're hopeful that that will continue. On the elections, we're now going to move towards the second round of legislative elections. We think that gives a really good opportunity for increased political dialogue. All the political parties have a, a significant number of candidates who are in part of those elections. So this, this is an opportunity for an inclusive process, for dialogue at the local level, at the national level. And we are extremely hopeful that those opportunities uh, will be taken by both the government and the political leaders, as the SG mentioned yesterday in his statement. I see nothing in Welcome to our Africa Tech segment. The COVID-19 pandemic brought about significant setbacks, but it also did bring opportunities for individuals and organizations to prove themselves. A number of tech startups experienced their own challenges, but those who could grab opportunities survived and played critical roles for economies. The pandemic changed the creation and survival of some startups, limiting their growth, but innovative firms reacted quickly and preferred flexible solutions as countries made the fast shift to digital work and helped incorporate technology into major services and structures. Well, we're now being joined by Olani Adeoshun, founder of Phone POS Tech Solutions. Thank you so much for joining us on our Africa Tech segment. Thank you for having me this evening. 
So how would you uh, describe the effects of the pandemic on technology startups? Oh, well, um, thank you again. Um, when one listens to your intro, it simply says that um, it was just um, it was a bag of, um, of multitudes, right? So for some people, it was an opportunity. For some people, it was a problem. You know, but every time for us, when we start a space, when there are problems, you understand, you see the opportunities in them, you know? So um, pretty unfortunate. It, I mean, it would have actually affected a lot of people. You know, jobs were lost. Um, homes, you know, homes were shattered. And a whole lot of problems came with you know, with, um, with the pandemic, you know. But again, on the flip side is the fact that it, it helps people to be able to think and look at um, the opportunities that can come from innovating solutions to those kind of problems. So for us, I mean, it's an opportunity to be able to do something new, you know, and challenge the brain. With these effects, how have startups been able to stand on their feet? Can you give a glimpse as to how some of these startups have reacted? Um, well, it's, it's, it's been tough, you know, for, for startups because, um, like, nobody saw it coming. Um, for all of us, um, we had our plans, you know, we had our pre-plans, you know, um, for other things, you know, and suddenly COVID came, you know. But the only thing we could do, you understand, was for us to be able to reinvent, you know, um, because we never planned for it, you understand. Um, when those kind of problems come, the only thing is for you to be able to just um, think outside the box again, you understand, and see how um, you can do something new. I, I remember that um, some venture capitalists actually came up um, with some opportunities for people who want to find solutions to these problems, and they were ready to fund them. You know, so I think there are about seven startups you know, that actually benefited from um, this opportunity when, um, when this happened about, that was about the second quarter of 2020. Okay, let's take a look at the government's role here. What should be the government's intervention in helping startups, especially during this troubling times amid the pandemic? Okay, one of the first things I'd like to address is the problem of um, the Nigerian government not being able to understand who startups are. You know, I mean, there's just, there's this multitude of confusion about what an MSME is, about um, what um, an SME is and what a startup is. Trust me, these three concepts, um, these three kinds of enterprises are all different, are very, very different. You know, but again, uh, we must give um, kudos to the government, you know, because when in, in, the, in, the, in the wake of the, um, of the pandemic, we saw the government come up with a lot of social interventions to be able to help families. Okay, that was very commendable. We also saw the government support SMEs, all right? So there were loans, you know, there were these loans that came, um, that was disbursed by, I think, um, um, NISA Microfinance Bank, by CDN and all. So for the, those that, they were the COVID loans, actually, you know. So, but again, in all of that arrangement, the startups were left out. So it looks like the government thinks that startups are SMEs. The startups and SMEs are different people. You know, we're solving different kinds of problems, while the SMEs, SMEs are doing something entirely different. So... It's for us to be able to let the government understand that, look, we are startups. We are not SMEs, you know. So the government needs to understand that, look, there's a sector of the economy that are called startups. We are there, but the government does not seem to have a focus, you know, on us because they don't even know that we exist. They don't even know that we are there. You know, so the only thing is for the government to first and foremost understand that we exist. If they don't understand that we exist, they can also have problems. So once they understand that we exist, then we can start to have that conversation, you understand, around solving our problems. All right, then. All right, then. Olani Adeoshun, thank you so much for sharing those insights with us on our Africa Tech segment. And do have a lovely weekend. Thank you, too. Thank you so much. And that's the program today. Thank you so much for watching. I'm Teniola Shuboale.